And uh, just what a, a privilege it is, um, you know, talking to Dez and talking to some other brothers about, you know, the Word of God going out and who they give Bibles to and all these kind of things. And we just have such a, such a privilege uh, to be able to have teaching like this in a, in a conference like this. So I'm so thankful to be a part of it. If you'll turn your Bibles with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. I was given the wonderful topic of regeneration do a study on our spiritual quickening unto life in Christ Jesus. I want to start here in Titus chapter 3. I want to read the first seven verses. We'll have a word of prayer and then begin. Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men, For we ourselves also are sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Father, we just thank you again for this opportunity to open up your word. We're thankful uh, for all the revelation that you give uh, to us in it about yourself through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, by the, Spirit of our, uh, by the Holy Spirit, and now that we have contained in words on pages, uh, to be able to have your thoughts within us and to uh, be able to have the things that you want to communicate and teach to us uh, within us, and we're just so thankful for that. And I pray that as we look at this issue of regeneration, uh, we would be refreshed and remember it if we have let it sit and uh, see the great privilege and, and honor uh, to be regenerated and also to take part in sharing the gospel, which is the means by which uh, you use to regenerate an individual. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, one of the things that I've been convicted about in a good way uh, over the course of these last couple of days was uh, the issue of sharing the gospel. Um, you probably look at my life sharing the gospel, and it's quite a shame. Um, but it's been a good conviction uh, to hear those things and to hear the testimonies and, and see that even take place throughout this, uh, this week with some individuals. And I, my hope and prayer is as we go through these, the issue of regeneration, uh, that it would be just one more piece of that good conviction or excitement to go out there and share the gospel uh, with folks. Regeneration, I would suggest to you, is, uh, is the, the other side of the coin of justification, as, as Brother Ray just taught. And when we look at and we've listened about the issue of forgiveness and redemption, uh, the issue of reconciliation, you're kind of dealing with the, the Christian legal, the legalese of Christianity uh, the indictment, the ramifications, the provision uh, for it all, and then the, the remedy uh, for our sin and our sin debt. And regeneration is kind of the, the commencement of the purpose of redemption, the purpose of forgiveness and, and reconciliation and justification. I think of it as if you were, uh, you were born in a prison, which is a horrible example, but uh, maybe it gets the point across. If you were, happened to be born in, in prison and all you knew was that prison, Brother Alex brought up that example of the bear uh, last night, but you were born in prison. All you knew was the the cold bars and the the, the cold floor, and uh, you know whatever food they they feed in there, and and you didn't know anything anything different. And then someone comes along and says, "There's so much more than this prison. There's roads out there. There's grass. There's the sun. There's there's light. There's there's a whole another life out there." And um, regeneration is that process of going from, from death to life. And it's, it's, it's that freedom issue, and that's what we're going to hone in on. But it, there's, there's purpose. There's a, there's a life to be lived. There's a life to get, and then there's a life to be lived. So regeneration is the process and power of God to spiritually quicken us, to give us life by the Holy Ghost that's in Christ Jesus. It's the operation of God to give spiritual life to one that is spiritually dead. It's the spiritual supernatural, if you will. As we look at this issue, we're going to put it under a microscope, if you will. We've 
talked about sharing the gospel, and that those issues are, are surface. But what happens when, when someone hears those words, hears the good news, hears the gospel, what is their response to both, supposed to be, and when they believe it, what takes place? And so I want to answer four questions. Uh, what is regeneration? What precedes regeneration? When does regeneration take place? And then leave off with, what, is it, what does it lead to? And as we look at it, we'll see there's a natural leading of it into uh, the life that we are to live. So look here at Titus chapter 3 and just some initial observations. It, you, of course, we see in verse 5 here, he says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's a, that's a mouthful, but it's a wonderful mouthful. Um, I want you to see, uh, back up just a little bit more. In verse 3, he says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Uh, regeneration is powerful. It, it makes our times sometimes. It makes these sometimes they were. It makes them the past tense. Regeneration makes our past our past. And uh, that's a powerful thing. We see here in verse 5, the, the washing of regeneration. There's a, there's a spiritual washing and cleansing. He's not talking about uh, water. Uh, the washing here is by the, the word of God in the gospel. It's a, there's a washing that takes place. There's a, a, a spiritual cleansing that takes place. It's, it's of the Holy Ghost, we see here there in verse 5. It's dependent on, if you look at verse 4, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. It's dependent upon the kindness and love of God, our Savior, having appeared. In verse 5, it's not by works of righteousness. We can't do this. It's according to his mercy. We see that. And then it's, it's the means by which we are saved. And what, what are we saved from? So as we look at what is regeneration, it's, it's powerful and it's, it's not by anything that we do. And we're dependent upon the kindness and love of God, and we're dependent upon, it it's depends upon the Holy Ghost to do it. Now, when we look at the word regeneration, you see it there in verse 5, by the washing of regeneration. You can see the, the root word is generation. You could even break that down uh, even further. And that, that root word generation, it's, it's, it's natural generation, which is the issue of of life, natural life, uh, conception and birth and those kind of things. Uh, when, the, when the translators were translating, they had a, a, a whole host of, of words. And I just want to give them to you because I, there's, a, there's a thread, and I think you'll be able to hear it even though I won't be able to pronounce these Greek words. But Genesis, Genesia, Genos, Geneo, Genema, and Genea. I probably didn't pronounce those. But you, you hear the the genesis, you hear the gene, the, the generation. Those are issues that when they went to go translate them, they were translated generation, born, begat, begotten, conceived, bear, B-E-A-R, brought forth, bear, B-A-R-E, birthday, in some context, offspring, countrymen, nation, stock, kinds, kindred, natural, nature, sometimes fruit and fruits, and then the other ones that have to do with the issue of, of timing, generation, um, the issue of times and old time, ages, all ages, and, and nation. If you come with me to Matthew chapter 1, uh, we see this, this natural generation here in the opening of the gospel accounts. Matthew chapter 1, and look at verse 1. Matthew 1, verse 1, he says, the book of the generation of who? Jesus Christ. So you have the, the generation. In, in the, the, the word there is Genesis. And it's the, it's the, the beginning of Christ. But naturally, we, we go, you go on in verse 18, and you see now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. And we, we see that there's a, a supernatural element to this in regards to his deity and how that's all going to come together. But you have this issue of, of generation, and I'm going to call it natural generation. That, that word is used over in James as well. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. In a couple places here in the book of James, James 1 and verse 23. 
I'm just trying to give you the sense of the root word of regeneration, generation. In James chapter 1, and look at verse 23, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his, what? Natural face in a glass. That word, they're natural. It's, it's the, the issue of nature. Look at James chapter 3 and look at verse 6. Speaking of the tongue here, and the power of the tongue, in verse 6 he says, the, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature. It is set on fire of, of hell. Uh, there's this, this is, issue of, of natural and, and nature when we look at the issue of, of generation. And when we think about it in the context of, of life, it's the giving of life. Come over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Now, when you begin to narrow your, fir- your focus on the, the issue of natural generation, conception and, and birth, and the giving of life and the breath of life, and the soul, and all these kind of things, uh, it becomes very fascinating. And you have passages in Scripture that you know, kind of speak to this issue. If you look at Psalm 139, verse 13. David speaking, he says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And I would suggest to you, as we we think about regeneration, we have something as a comparison, but also a contrast in in natural generation. Uh, Here, David David says that uh, he was covered in his mother's womb. He says he was fearfully and wonderfully made. If that is what we have with this, this flesh, how much more in regards to our spiritual life? In Ephesians chapter 2, we learn that we're created in Christ Jesus. We're created in Christ Jesus. And, and, and if we're fearfully and wonderfully made here, how much more in, in regeneration are we fearfully and wonderfully made in Christ? If, if this flesh, this body, is a marvelous, is part of the marvelous works of God, how much more that work of God in regeneration, how much more marvelous is it? He says, my substance was not hid from thee. Well, it's hid from everyone else, especially at this, at this time. They didn't have all the technology to uh, look into the mother's womb. And he was hid. He was hid, but not hid from God. Uh, we, we saw last night in, in Colossians, Brother Alex went to the, the issue of our, our life is hid with Christ in God. Our life is hid. We, we learn in Romans chapter 8 that there's a glory in us that one day will be revealed, but now it's not. It's clothed with this, this flesh, but regeneration is this, this work of God to give spiritual life. So when we contrast it to natural generation and we think about the glory that is involved in that, how greater is the issue of regeneration? That regeneration is closely attached to what we just learned about in regards to justification. Come with me to Galatians chapter 3. As we move on a little bit further here. Galatians chapter 3. It's closely attached to righteousness, and it's a point that I want to emphasize, that when we think about regeneration, it comes on the heels of justification. I mean, it's really hard to put these in some kind of sequential order however it's it's very closely attached when you're thinking about spiritual life we are to think about righteousness now according to titus 3 not works of righteousness that we have done but right the righteousness of god look at galatians 3 and uh, verse 21 paul is again dealing with the galatians who are going back under the law uh, but here he says in verse 21, is, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law, if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily, what? Righteousness should have been by the law. If the law could have provided righteousness, then it could have given life. 
but it can't give the righteousness that we need, and therefore it couldn't give life. If, the, if there would have been any law that could have done that, surely, verily, it would have been by the law, but it couldn't do that. And, and I want you to see the connection with the issue of giving life here. What kind of life is he talking? He's not talking about they're breathing right there. As it, you know, when he writes to them and they're reading this, they're, they're breathing, they got life. It's, it's a spiritual life. It's the, it's the regenerated life that he's talking about. We learned, he, Paul quotes in Romans chapter 1, Habakkuk 2 there, the issue of the just shall what? Live by faith. You have faith, you have the just, the issue of righteousness, and the issue of living. And so justification and regeneration, they go hand in hand because the, the, the regenerated life that we have is, is associated and rooted in the, the righteousness of God that's in Christ Jesus. And that's in, the, it, that's in our gospel. That's in Paul's gospel. Look at Romans 3. Come over to Romans chapter 3. And look at verse 21. We know these verses. If not, I encourage you to, to, to know them. Romans chapter 3 and look at verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of who? The righteousness of God by the faith of Jesus Christ has now been manifested. And notice he says, unto all and upon all them that believe. It's it's unto all and it's upon them that believe. When they believe, they get this righteousness by the faith of Jesus Christ. And not only are they justified, but they have new life because the the nature of regeneration is attached to the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That is life. It's hard for me not to get to my last point. It's what what it leads to. He's purified unto himself. He's redeemed to himself a a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The, The regeneration in view of the righteousness of Christ were filled with the fruits of righteousness which are be, by Jesus Christ, leads to being able to approve things that are excellent, he says in Philippians chapter 1. It, to approve things that are excellent, to, to abound more in, in love one toward another. It's that righteousness and love in the gospel that we hear that frees us and justifies us from everything that was passed that is contrary to God, and it gives us not only a right standing with God as, as he impu, uh, uh, imputes his righteousness to us, but it's life. Righteousness is life. That's why Paul goes to great lengths, I believe, in Romans 6, when he talks about the issue, do we, do we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Don't you know what you are saved from? Don't you know what you're saved by? Don't you know what has given you life? And now the issue is you have that, you possess that. The issue is to, to walk that out in what you have. So this is, a, again, an amazing thing, this issue of regeneration. Now, since we're here in Romans, come over to chapter 5. I want you to see, again, where do we get this natural generation from? Well, originally, of course, God made Adam, but then this is passed down uh, from Adam and Adam and Eve, and, and also we see the necessity of why we would need to be regenerated. But look at Romans chapter 5 and look at verse 12. He says, Wherefore, as by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Notice the connection of sin and death here. The totality of death, as we talk about salvation in the three tenses, the, it's also death in the three tenses, right? Uh, Adam didn't immediately, physically, naturally die as soon as he partook of the, of the fruit, nor Eve. Uh, but there was spiritual death, physical death to follow. So too with us in Christ, we are able to get spiritual life, and eventually there will be, I can't really call it physical life in the resurrection because it's really a, uh, a physical, spiritual life, if we, can, if we can do that. We're going to get a new body, but it's a, it's a spiritual body. And, and all because of, of Christ. And so we see what we get from, um, from Adam here is sin and death. Both physically we will die, but also we're born spiritually dead. Hence we need to be regenerated. 
We need to be regenerated. Now, what is the nature? Come back to, let's just look at that word one more time. Look at Titus chapter 3. When you look at that word in verse 5, regenerated, you, you, you see the prefix there, re, and then, and then generation. And that word, that, that, that prefix, oftentimes, not all the time, but most of the time, I would say, re means the issue of again, again. And one of the things that, as I was going through this, that usually when we read in English something that's re, regeneration, you're thinking about the, the regeneration, the generation that needs to take place again would be the, the first generation. It, it would be the, the, the issue of if natural regeneration is my physical life, then regeneration is, well, I need to physically live again. And it kind of doesn't make sense when you think of it that way. What's interesting, when you think about it that way, you can think about John chapter 3 and Nicodemus. And he talks, and Christ is talking to Nicodemus there about being born again. And what is Nicodemus' response? He says, can I enter into my mother's womb a second time? And we look at it and we're like, come on, Nicodemus. Get with it. And he tells him that. The Lord tells him that. You're a master in Israel and you don't know these things? Right? And he says, it's not, it's not that. The, the issue there, the, the being born again, wasn't the issue of just physically living again. We see this even with Lazarus in the resurrection. I mean, poor Lazarus. I mean, what an amazing thing that took place. But that was not the resurrection that Martha spoke about in regards to in the day of resurrection. That's not what Lazarus experienced. He, 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 he experienced a a physical resurrection of, of natural generation. And he's doing, let's look at that real quick. Look at John chapter 11. And, and Christ does that to teach, I believe, of the issue of his spiritual resurrection. Look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11, we've got, we got to jump in here, but look at verse 24. It says, Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and what? The life. Wait a minute. He's living, there's people living around him. Okay, well, Lazarus, he's dead. Okay, life. Be resurrected again. And listen, that's what they're wanting. That's what, she, that's what Lazarus' sisters want. And, and he's, he's teaching them there's something even greater than this. There's something greater than me just being having the power to naturally raise this person from the dead. I mean, it's supernatural, but to give a, a, a natural resurrection. And he says, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me... Now, he talks about two things here. He says, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's what he's going to do to, to Lazarus, naturally, but that's what he's going to do in the day of resurrection, as being spoken about here. That's what he's going to do to all those that are his. But then notice verse 26, and he says, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never what? That's spiritual. And he asks her a question, believest thou this? And she believes that he's the Son of God, and that's what she needed to believe at this time. And she had passed from death to life. Now, previous to this in John's Gospel, in John 5, 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Now, this is not something that they physically experienced that's why it was so hard for them to grasp to understand the spiritual reality that he was teaching them in john 6 verse 63 and 64 it is the spirit that quickeneth when he tells them to eat my flesh and drink my blood he says it is the spirit that quickeneth the flesh profiteth nothing the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and they are life and then, lead, again, all leading up to this, in John 11, John 8, verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. 
He's talking about spiritual. So when we think about regeneration, it's not just the issue of one day uh, you're going to be resurrected again in this, this body. And we, we know that. We get that. But that's not what regeneration is. He says over in John 3, that which is born of the flesh is what? Flesh, that which is born of the spirit is what? Is spirit. And therefore, we need a spiritual resurrection, if you will. We need a spiritual generation. We need regeneration. The quickening of our dead spirit. Your spirit is dead. Now, how can, in regeneration, how can there be life given to that which is, which is dead? Usually when we think, again, about physically, generation, we're not dead. We just don't exist. And in, in natural generation, there's, there's life that is commenced there. Regeneration is different, again. It's, the, it's not after the flesh. It's, it's after the spirit. Come over to Galatians chapter 4, if you will. Galatians chapter 4, look at verse 29. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29 says, But as then he that was born after the flesh, speaking of, of uh, Isaac there and Ishmael, he says, Persecuted him that was born after the who? The spirit. Even so, it is now. When we believe the gospel, when we believe Paul's gospel, we're, we're born after the Spirit. We are regenerated. And this, again, is, is different than being born after the flesh. The, the effect cannot be better than the cause. The, the, the Spirit is greater than the, the flesh, but yet the flesh can't produce what the Spirit needs. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, needs to produce what our spirit needs. In our spirit, we're born spiritually dead. Now, that's what precedes regeneration. Regeneration is this spiritual life that we get the moment that we believe. It's the operation of God. that The, that the Spirit gives us life, and it's connected to the issue of, of righteousness. There are two sides of the, the same coin. And what precedes regeneration is that we're, we're dead. We need something of us to, to die. And we need our dead spirit to, to die because the issue in regeneration and in, in being, our, our spirit being dead is not a cessation of activity. Our spirit is actually very active. Uh, we've looked at some of them in the, in the conference already, Romans chapter 1. Let me, let me give you another one, uh, a couple other ones. Come with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. When we think about spiritual death, it's not a cessation of activity. It's very active. You go out to the world and share the gospel with someone, and you'll begin to experience and hear their spiritual deadness. And if you look at Ephesians 2 here in verse 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were, what? Dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world. Does this, was there deadness and trespasses and sins? Did it not walk? Did it cease to function and move and have its being? No. It, it walked. And it walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now, what? Worketh in the children of disobedience. The, the spirit that, that they were operating upon of this world, it, it kept them in their their deadness and their trespasses and sins, it catered to that, and it, and it went to work. And, they, and it went to work fulfilling, as he's going to say in verse 3, among whom we also, among whom also we all had our conversation times past in the lusts of our flesh. What's the next word? Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind. And by nature the children of wrath even as others. Were, man fulfills. The Spirit works in them. They walk in deadness. And when you understand regeneration, it's, it's very clear, someone who has not believed the gospel, 
this is how we are to walk by faith and understand their predicament. And if we are able to evaluate that, at least in me, it convicts me to share the gospel. Because it's not like they're on the fence. Maybe they're on the fence in their, in their head. But before God, it's, it's not like they're 90% there. You're either dead or alive. And, and the issue is, is they're dead. And they're dead in their trespasses and sins. Come over to Ephesians 4. He deals with this a little bit more in a little bit different detail. But look at Ephesians 4 and verse 17. He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye, these believers at Ephesus, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the, what? Life of God. Now, what do we, again, connect the life of God to? Righteousness. And we see what they're doing. Well, they're dead in trespasses and sins. And what does someone who is active in trespasses and sins do? They fulfill the lust of the flesh. They engage in those things, and that's what he's saying here. He says, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. A whole bunch of unrighteousness. And their darkened mind justifying their wisdom and their philosophy and their vain deceit. That's not after Christ justifying their actions to keep them dead. That's what precedes regeneration. That we are children, by nature we are children of wrath. Children of disobedience dead in trespasses and sins, and yet not a cessation of activity, but actually very busy conjuring up wisdom to justify our evil deeds. My body, my choice. Right? All these things that are, that are out there, that just, there's, there's so many of them. And Paul brings up some of them. They were saying in Corinth, the body is for fornication, fornication for the body. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Right? All this, all this wisdom, and then you've got the, the religion, religion wisdom, if I can call it that, to justify and, and clothe themselves in this darkness to keep doing what they're, they're doing. And that's why when we come with the gospel, when we come with the, the righteousness of God that's by the faith of Jesus Christ and we're presenting it to them, it's doing two things. It's shedding light on their darkness, trying to, to penetrate that darkness. And it's powerful to do that. It, it shines light on their darkness of, of their excuses of why they do what they do. And then it exposes them. They begin to start to see their nakedness before the holy, holy, holy God. And they can either retreat and they can, they can try to hold on to that darkness, which many of them do. Or we come along and we give them the good news. The good news is that those things that you have been justifying, those things that you're doing, those things that really are your, your nakedness, can be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You can be forgiven all of your sins, and you can get a righteousness that's alien to you, but is life-giving from God if you just believe it. That's what allows one to go from spiritual death in their trespasses and sins with all that activity to spiritual life. I, as I was studying this, I, I was just refreshed and blown away again that those words in the gospel are committed to our trust. When you begin to put regeneration and look at it under the, the spiritual microscope, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a hidden thing, right? When we, when, we think, when we talk about giving the gospel, right, it's not some, you know, goosebump salvation, some ir, uh, experiential salvation, you know, that someone's got to have this experience. It's, we, it, was, it was being said yesterday, in the, in, the, in the quietness of your heart. And it's like, if you were to look outwardly, it's like, that, there's no power in that. And yet, when you understand regeneration under the spiritual microscope, you begin to see the power that it is. From death to life. To someone loving their sin, justifying it, 
to now having a conscience about it, being convicted, and yet not running away from God, but running to God for the remedy, for the salvation, for the, the clothing of his righteousness in Christ Jesus. That is an amazing thing. That's a powerful thing. That's, that's the spiritual supernatural, if you will. And so regeneration, what precedes it is that spiritual deadness. Now, when does regeneration take place? I already made mention of it just a little bit ago, but, but first of all, I just want to run a few verses here to show you who, who does it. The whole Godhead is involved in regeneration. Come with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. One of the other terms to put in our vocabulary when we're considering regeneration is the issue of quicken. Uh, not only the, the issue of making alive um, but it's, it's instantaneous. If we talk about the rapture and our bodily resurrection, it, well, Paul talks about it. We just, of course, learn it. 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, a twinkling of an eye, right? In regards to our re- bodily resurrection, uh, so too with our, our spiritual, uh, with, with regeneration. It's, it's, we're quickened. Uh, we're made alive. And again, you have to believe that. You have to take those words on faith and, and understand what that word means. It's not, you know, maybe some of you got up this morning and it wasn't really quick, you know, roll over. Like, you're waking up, but it's, it's slow going. And sometimes I'm like that. But quicken is the issue. It's, you know, like the alarm goes off. And you're like, whoa! You know, it's like really quick. And that's what it is. The, the, the moment that we believe the gospel, God gives us life. He's offering and is promising, promising it. Look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. And look at verse 13. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. God who quickeneth what? All things. He's in the, he's in the quickening business. There's much more I could say about that. But uh, look at Ephesians chapter 2. We were just here a moment ago. But look at verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. After giving that the classification of who we were before in time past, dead in our trespasses and sins, the thing that changes that in verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath what? Quickened us together with Christ. God quickens, he quickens us, he quickens us together with Christ. Christ. And then we see in Titus chapter 3, you have this, this issue of the, the Holy Ghost quickens us. But when does it take place? If I can compare again with what we know about natural generation and, and the moment of conception, I once saw a video and I couldn't find it again, so you'll have to fact check me, but scientists were doing some stuff, probably that they weren't supposed to be doing, but what they found in regards to uh, the moment of conception, when the when the seed joins with the the egg of the woman, is that there was a flash of light. It was just it was just quick, and they had to slow it down and all those kind of things. There was a there was a flash of light, and there was of course life is there. When the gospel of the grace of God works its way to the heart. And the gospel functions both as the light through the darkness, but also it's looking to get to the heart. And the heart has now the opportunity to uh, respond to the gospel. And it's being shown for what it is. The darkness is being revealed and stripped away. And now they, they see their, their nakedness. When, when the heart believes, it's like the, the seed of the man and the egg of the woman when they're joined. But this joining is not natural. It's a, it's, it's, unnatural it's supernatural it's that of the spirit and just as there's life there at the moment of conception so too is there spiritual life at the moment of regeneration when that when that individual believes the gospel if if you could have a spiritual microscope on when someone believes the gospel if you could walk by faith in all of that and 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 see the moment that took place now they might not know and and the day or the, the hour, but, but theologically, from the scriptures, when we understand what that is, 
is the moment that they believe. It's the, the heart receiving that which they were once rejecting, but, the, but them receiving the, the, the salvation, the forgiveness of their sins, and the receiving of the, of the righteousness of God that's in Christ, by the faith of Jesus Christ. The, 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 the moment that takes place, there's regeneration because life is in that righteousness. And that righteousness is in the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. The moment that happens, there's regeneration. It's such a powerful thing. And we can't see it by sight. But if we can see it by faith, we see how grand that it is. This changes everything. This changes everything about that individual, that individual's spirit and their life before God. It changes everything. They might not know it. They might not feel it. But before God, it changes everything. And what was all that was the the working of the gospel in the inner man concerning sin and righteousness. Sin and righteousness. So when we think about regeneration... Comparing it to the natural, that, that issue of conception and the, these two component parts making one, we learn in, in 1 Corinthians the issue that, that we are joined in, in one spirit with, with Christ and, and we have this life. We become born after the spirit because it's not the issue of what we do. It's not our, our own works of righteousness, but it's by what Christ has done for us. Now, to conclude, I want to answer the final question I posed. What, what does regeneration lead to? I come over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And look at verse 11. It says, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but what? Alive unto God, how? Through, right, Jesus Christ our Lord. As we've received Christ Jesus our Lord, right, in, in Colossians, he says, he says, so walk ye in him. When we received him, it was a matter of life connected with righteousness. So too is there, those righteousness now is to, to come out as we yield to it. It's not something we're conjuring up. It's not something that, uh, that we're making up. It's not our own works of righteousness. We don't now take the law that we use the flesh, right? That can't produce the life of Christ, um, not only in regeneration, of course, but also uh, uh, functionally as we, we live out. But we're dead to sin now and alive unto God. And he says in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. His conclusion in view of the identity is now don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Verse 13, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, because you are. And your members are as instruments of what? Righteousness. That's what's gave you life in the first place. That's life now that can never be taken away, but on, on a day to day basis, that's your life now every day. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We only get that spiritual mind in the Word of God, which we've had many lessons on. Through the Word of God, rightly divided, through the, the Word of God, that Word of Christ dwelling richly in us, it's Him first getting that in us, dwelling richly within us, and then it going to work out of us. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 2. There's two more here. Ephesians 2. Our regeneration has made us a new man. In verse 10 here of Ephesians 2, he says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. 
That's our regeneration. We're created now in Christ Jesus, taken out of Adam and put into Christ. And notice what it's unto. Unto what? Good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Titus chapter 3, and we'll end here. Titus chapter 3. When he brings up regeneration in verse 5, it's in the context of his exhortation in verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to, what? Every good work. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle. Showing all meekness unto all men, for we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. That's what changed everything. And then what changes everything for you is not your works of righteousness, verse 5, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. The application of that love and kindness to the individual by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. How are we able to do the things that he exhorts us? It's not through our flesh, it's not through our own wisdom, but it's by looking back at the power of God in the gospel to regenerate us in connection with the righteousness that's in Jesus Christ. And as we know him more and we look to him more and we believe in that more, we're changed. And we love him more. We love righteousness more. We love his things. We love the light. And we grow in that. Regeneration is not an end of itself. It's a means, a powerful means to an end. Your natural conception and mind and birth was not the end. It was a means to an end to grow up in the things that we had completely the moment that we were conceived. You have everything that you need the moment you're conceived. It's the issue of growing that out as a, a, as a earthen vessel. And in Christ, to take what we have in Christ and to grow that out as a, in an earthen vessel but for his, his heavenly glory. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this time to examine the issue of regeneration and see its glory, see its power. We only have this understanding and knowledge because of your word. It's not something that we could ever make up or, or think of, yet you revealed it to us. And so may it excite us and thrill our soul, not only in what took place to us the moment we believed, uh, but also when we share the gospel with someone else and that uh, they profess to believe it, we understand the powerful work that was done. And may we see uh, the the power and the change that it can make uh, to your honor and glory. We give you all the thanks and praise in Christ's name. Amen.